So Tim's analysis, offered up in 2007, remarkably simple. I'm not going to take you through all the detail. You sort of know what this looks like. Here we are today, roughly 768 grams of CO2 emitted per dollar of value created. It's probably gone down a little bit since then, maybe because of the economic recession, who knows. Slightly better in the UK because of the wondrous uh, eff efficacy of Mrs. Thatcher in closing down our coal pits. And here we are in Japan with the world's most carbon-efficient economy. So that's roughly what we look like today. Just stick with that for the moment, OK? That's because of China, the United States, India, various other countries that have it up at that level. 768 grams, grams of CO2 emitted for every dollar of value created in the global economy. Now, ask yourself what politicians today like to talk about. Well, they like to talk about doing the Millennium Development Goals. We thought we might be able to get them done by 2012 or 2020, maybe, but just accept it takes us till 2050, OK? We like to talk about the idea of doing something around emissions. And at the very least, we like to think we can do a 50% reduction in global emissions by 2050. We don't like to do anything about population, so just bank the fact that we've got 9 billion people, because that'll be easier for the purposes of this evening. And in the rich world, we love to do economic growth. So allow for roughly 2% per annum growth in rich world economies, OECD economies, over the next 40 years. Four things that practically every politician goes along with. Not much we can do about 9 billion people. 2% growth is really the very lowest we should be aiming at. And boy, would we like it to be higher here in the developed but rather tired economies of the OECD. We want seriously to do the MDGs, the Millennium Development Goals, because that's just sensible. And we know without a 50% reduction by 2050, we're stuffed. Scientific description now I'm in the Royal Society. I know that that's very important. <laughs> so with that scenario, you have to go to six grams of CO2 for every dollar of value created in the global economy. That's our journey, as Tim says. This is our destiny, almost, as the human species. And this is still premised on the assumption that staying below that 2 degrees centigrade threshold would actually protect us from runaway climate change. And we're not at all certain about that. Anyway, we're really not. Increasingly uncertain, in fact, as the years go by. So that's the story, 130-fold improvement. And then maybe we have to push on to absolutely zero dollars zero grams of CO2 per dollar of value created by 2100. So this is embarrassing for any economist, but just go with me because I like to make this simple for people like me, OK? So here we are today, roughly at 750 grams of CO2 equivalent per dollar of value created. And this is where we have to be by 2050. Six. Looks good. Here we are today with the price of carbon best price you can really get once you amalgamate the carbon reduction commitment, the European Emissions Trading Scheme, offset schemes of one kind or another, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, coming in at around $10 a tonne. In the latest report from the Committee on Climate Change, it has indicated that we would need to get to something much closer to £200 a tonne. So I've just cheated a bit. I'm still using dollars here but I'm basically working on their assumption that we'd need to go to something like $250 a tonne to drop CO2 intensity in the global economy down to the figure on which the survival of humankind depends. So that's our sort of biophysical reality. This is our economic reality. $10 to $250 over 40 years. The smart ones amongst you, possibly even some economists who can still count will tell that this is just $6 per annum for 40 years. $6 per tonne per annum doesn't sound too scary. <coughs> Unless you're a politician tracking this out over 40 years, in which case you know that looks extremely scary. So politicians love to do decoupling until they are asked to contemplate the consequences of this from a political perspective. What would it take to broker a negotiated deal with electorates all around the world to take the price of carbon to $240 a tonne over the next 40 years. And many would argue 
it would take something resembling the ultimate apocalypse that we're desperate to avoid. Especially since, as you know, this is compounded by the fact that we're now stuck in a world in which everybody essentially wants to live like we do. Many sociologists and economists call this the hedonic treadmill, the idea that we've got used to and content with the notion of pursuing personal meaning and national significance via increases in consumption-driven GDP year on year. We're very comfortable with that in a funny kind of way. And not only are we very comfortable with it, so are increasingly large numbers of people in the rest of the world. So if you look at what's happening to purchasing power in countries like China and India, which is pretty extraordinary, we already have around 400 to 450 million middle-class citizens in China and India who have every intention of living as well, if not better, than we do today. The hedonic treadmill has worked incredibly well. We've drawn hundreds of millions of people onto that treadmill. So decoupling against that backdrop begins to look really pretty problematic. And yet if you stripped politicians of their decoupling rhetoric, they would look more naked than any naked emperor you have ever seen. So what do we do about that? Well, then we go into our innovation space. And so do I, by the way. I am so excited about what's happening around the innovation pipeline today that I spend most of my time in my good moments talking about the power of innovation and the degree to which it can bring us huge benefits. Particularly love to do this in front of audiences that are still stuck in some pretty old paradigms about what technology shift looks like. So when the Harvard Business Review came out with this fulsome acknowledgement that actually sustainability now is, be, is one of the biggest drivers of innovation in the world today, it spoke to a, a part of the sustainability world, the environment world, that I think we all long to be true and more powerful in our lives today. So technologies like this, if you're not excited by this kind of stuff, then God help you, because really and truly you're far too gloomy for your own good. <laughs> this is one now of about 35 reasonably large-scale concentrating solar power plants. This one happens to be in Spain, uh, just outside Seville, 22 megawatts of CSP. You all know this technology, I'm sure. Incoming solar radiation on the, bounced off these mirrors onto these towers here which heat up to a very high temperature, which produces a large amount of steam, which produces, guess what, at the end of the day, electrons, the kind of bits of the energy system that we still long for. Fantastic. There are something like 68 new CSP schemes in the pipeline today around the world. Because of government subsidy, it has to be admitted, but nonetheless because the technology is maturing quite quickly. Maybe this is your bag. This is the first pure EV electric vehicle produced by this company in China called BYD, Build Your Dreams, the company in which Warren Buffett chose to invest nearly a third of a billion dollars. <coughs> BYD will be bringing this all-electric, pure electric, to market at the beginning of next year at a price which most of us in this audience couldn't believe <coughs> possible. And why? because they think they've cracked the battery technology end of it, and that they can do a rollout at scale in China, which will permit them to move from being no kind of technology-driven company at all to one of the leading technology companies in the world today. So we can all get excited about this, and we need to. This is a quote from Steve Chu in the run-up to Cancun. Now, as you know, Steve Chu, Energy Secretary of the United States, you must wonder what your role is in the United States, having been cut off at the pass, as it were, by the midterm elections, and knowing full well that nothing, but nothing, on climate change will get through Congress from now on. It is completely blocked off. So spot the dynamic here. Very interesting. This is Steve Chu's attempt to galvanize America around good old-fashioned nationalism, chauvinism even, referring back to what happened in the 1960s when the Russians were the first to put a Sputnik in space to begin to explore that whole dimension of human living in such a way that outraged Americans, absolutely outraged them. Space was American, basically. 
It wasn't the territory of the Russians. They didn't have enough money, enough Noah, enough technology to get into space before the Americans. Who the bloody hell did they think they were? And the Americans took serious umbrage to the tune of countless billions of dollars, which were then deployed from the mid-1960s through the next decades so that America became, in time, the winners of the space race, the indisputed, undisputed winners of the space race. So here's Steve Chu pressing the same chauvinism, nationalism button, saying if America doesn't do now what it did in the 60s to see off the Russians, if it doesn't do what it has to do now to see off the Chinese, because rest assured the Russians have no interest in this agenda whatsoever, <laughs> then we'll be in as much trouble as we were back in the 1960s. If you're deprived of access to a legitimate decision-making process, which is what the Obama administration has been deprived of, then you move into some interesting, difficult thickets of policy making to get some headway. So that's innovation for you. It's important. Thank God it's out there. Thank God the pipeline is fatter every year. Thank God there's more and more in the pipeline. And it is of an increasingly convincing and, to me, persuasive kind in terms of bringing solutions to the world's problems today. And lastly, I have to say a quick word about marketization. We've all, of course, been absorbed with the latest about ways in which we're trying to put an economic value on ecosystem services, on different parts of the natural world, to persuade those who are the owners of, or the tenants, depending on your language, the owners of those natural assets, that there is going to be a viable economic model which will pay them as much for keeping those assets intact as for cutting them down, exploiting them, or destroying them in pursuit of short-term marketizable profit. It's a big deal. Cancun has moved the debate about TEEB a little bit further forward, the debate about marketization a little bit further forward, as we know. It looks like this, really. Very simply, this is Indonesian rainforest, pristine Indonesian rainforest. As the Indonesian government would probably somewhat irreverently put it, worth bugger all to us here in Indonesia and to our poor people. Whereas this, which is the palm oil plantation, is worth a lot to Indonesia, to its government, to its people. And Indonesia quite rightly asks, on what basis are you suggesting that we cannot use that to create this, to generate the returns which will allow us to address issues to do with poverty today? Teeb, all of that marketization story, is an endeavor to put as much of an economic value in, on this as is already there on that to persuade the Indonesian government, the government of the Democratic Republic of Congo, the government of Brazil and many other countries, that it would be worth their while to keep it like that rather than convert it to that. And it would be worth their economic while, not just their moral standing in the international community, which doesn't cut much ice in countries like Brazil or Indonesia, as you know. Now, the problem? Well, this is the problem. Norway's offered Indonesia a billion dollars to sort out some Teeb look-alike deal to protect huge amounts of Indonesia's pristine rainforest, particularly the bits that are on the bogs, the peat bogs. Many individual companies, including companies like Shell, are now fairly far advanced in negotiating bilateral deals with Indonesia to protect particularly sensitive bits of the bog-rich environments which Indonesia has said it needs to convert into palm oil. Indonesia is no easy country to work with, as we know, and the likelihood of a billion Norwegian dollars ending up accountably, transparently, and effectively in the places where it would be needed to prevent that eventually getting turned into that despite the billion dollars is a pretty big ask. Now, I don't want to pick on Indonesia. Please don't think this phenomenon is unique to the developing and emerging economies. How many of you here think the United States today serves as a bastion of the kind of democratic values that we hold dear? For me, America is one of the most sophisticated examples of pol politically corrupt governance systems anywhere in the world. It is still driven 100% by the good old pork barrel, 
and the deeper you can dip into the pork barrel, you get your returns as a politician in America. You buy your way into politics. There is no such thing as success in US politics without buying your way into positions of influence as you climb that greasy pole.